This material is a part of the Oklahoma Historical Society's Oral History Program Living Legends Collection. This material is a Frontiers of Science Chamber of Commerce forum and reception to honor the astronauts Commander Eugene Cernan and Colonel Tom Stafford. This uh, reception took place on July the 8th, 1966. The man officiating over the ceremonies is Mayor George Shirk. This material is being re-recorded on September the 23rd, 1985 for inclusion in the permanent collections of the Oral History Program by Judith Michener. Testing, one, two, three, four. Can you hear me out there, Ernie? Testing, one, two, three, four. Okay, General Jones, Mayor Rader. Us mayors always have to recognize each other, you know. Distinguished guests, this is a great day for Oklahoma City. For you visitors, you'll be pleased to know this is the largest luncheon crowd that has ever gathered in Oklahoma City. It is a great day. We're delighted. Uh, you know, Dr. Bika, as I think, uh, as to my part in the program, I realize that man often does live by form rather than by substance. I have particular reference to this philosophy of a key to the city. Uh, when we realize that uh, in the old and medieval times, uh, it was necessary for the mayor of the city to meet a distinguished guest at the gates and give him a key. Because without a key, he literally couldn't get into town. Because there was a gate and a wall that surrounded that city and protected it from unknown dangers. May I point out to you, sir, that through your work and those of your colleagues, Commander Cernan and Colonel Stafford. The idea of a wall and a barrier and all of those matters are as remote to us as the pyramids are remote to us in point of time. Yet, by some oddity, it's still appropriate that the mayor of a city extend a key as the official form of our welcome. I extend it to you three gentlemen in that sense. Dr. Beaker, in the thought that this is a key to a non-existent gate in a wall that is indeed non-existent around a city that is indeed most existent, I would like to ask you, sir, to come with me and let me formally make you a... <coughs> now, you... Uh, you indeed, sir, are able to uh, enter that non-existent gate to a 1966-style existent city. Colonel Stafford, I would like very much to ask you, sir, to accept this key from us here in Oklahoma City. I have secured Mayor Rader's permission. I've assured him that by your having this key will in no sense mean that we've annexed the city of Weatherford. And uh, Commander Cernan, I uh, give you this key with some trepidation. I watched you perform coming in in the motorcade, and as far as I'm concerned, we can't get you out of town quick enough. <laughs> because you stay any longer, I'll be out of a job next April. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Thank you, Mr. Young. Colonel Stafford, Commander Cernan, ladies and gentlemen. We are living in an age of scientific knowledge and achievement unparalleled in the history of the world, an era in which a manned space flight covering one and a half million miles can be completed in the brief span of three days, an era in which major scientific discoveries bordering on the miraculous are being made almost faster than the scientific community can assimilate them. While most of us merely stand in awe of these accomplishments on the four frontiers of science, our special guests today are bold participants in this scientific drama. Astronauts Stafford and Cernan perform their brilliant feats from countdown to splashdown before millions of television viewers. Our speaker today is a private hero 
working in private industry, but he works for the same ultimate goal, the betterment of mankind. Dr. Arthur M. Bika directs one of the largest private research efforts in the world. He is vice president in charge of the General Electric Research and Development Center, or as they say in the trade, he is VP of the GE R&D. <laughs> the center has a staff of 1,800 men and women, including some 700 scientists and engineers. He is the latest of the distinguished scientists to hold similar positions in General Electric. His predecessors include such famous persons as Whitney Coolidge Suits and that engineering genius, Charles Proteus Steinmetz, who has been called the father of modern electricity. The fact that our speaker has been chosen to follow these distinguished men of science by a company that owes much of its progress to scientific achievement is indicative of the scope of his abilities. Dr. Bika joined General Electric in 1950. As a working scientist, he became widely known for his work on the physics and chemistry of polymers and the effects of high energy radiation on plastic materials. Dr. Bika has contributed to the success of many scientific ventures and projects ranging from improved man-made diamonds to selective membranes that behave much like human lung tissue and from important new kinds of fuel cells to a completely new basic chemical technique called oxidative coupling. I'm sure that all of you are more anxious to hear what this learned gentleman has to say than, he, than to hear what I have to say about him. So at this time, it is my pleasure to present to you Dr. Bika speaking on the excitement of discovery. Dr. Bika. First, let me say that I'm sure that if all of you are as interested in hearing what follows me as I am, that we could agree that I should sit down. Chairman Young, Mayor Shirk, President McGee, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. Peggy, my wife and I are just overwhelmed with the warm hospitality of Oklahoma. This is tremendous. And Mayor Shirk, there's certainly no wall around the, the hearts of these warm and friendly people that we've met. This is wonderful. Another thing before I get into my prepared remarks that I'd like to say is that I sense a spirit, a spirit of the future here in Oklahoma City. Much of this is due, I'm sure, to the efforts of the frontiers of science, to the Chamber of Commerce, but perhaps most of all to the people of Oklahoma. It's certainly an enjoyable spirit to, to, uh, to observe. Now, one of these honored guests here today, or perhaps both of them, or in any event, a pair of their fellow astronauts, soon will be standing on the moon. According to the NASA timetable, there are only about 1,000 working days left before what surely will be the most exciting single moment in human history. We can expect that the pulse rates and blood pressures of these first lunar visitors will be microwaved back to Earth and broadcast to hundreds of millions of us earthbound people. Indeed, it, it won't be surprising if some enterprising newsman also monitors the heartbeats of the astronauts watching wives, for purposes of comparison only. But such statistics will hardly measure the true excitement of, of, that these brave men and equally brave women will experience. And as our own hearts pound, living this moment vicariously, each of us will know an unprecedented thrill as we share in the fulfillment of this magnificent human achievement. Now only a few courageous men like astronauts Thomas Stafford and Eugene Cernan can now contemplate the thrills of space travel on a personal basis. And only a few courageous ladies like the charming pair here today, Mrs. Stafford and Mrs. Cernan, 
can know how it feels to have husbands engaged in such an, uh, a vital and ultimate adventure. But we should remember that nature has provided all of us with the opportunity to participate in the excitement of discovery. This earth has only one moon and only a pair of men who can be the first to stand on it. But our earth and everything about us still contains millions of mysteries, uncounted unlocked secrets, unlimited opportunities for you and for me to make explorations of our own and seek the fun and thrill and excitement of discovery. The wonderful thing about exploring the frontiers of science, seeking new knowledge about nature, is that it can provide a succession of thrills. First, the thrill of getting a good idea. Second, the thrill of having it actually work. Third, the thrill of putting it to use for mankind. And finally, the thrill of knowing that every discovery is a stepping stone to yet another opportunity. The difficult thing about exploring the frontiers of science is that between the moments of excitement, there are inevitably long periods of just plain hard work and frustration. And these two astronauts here today can assure you that such periods do occur. Now, I'm not going to presume to try to describe the problems and challenges and special kinds of excitement reserved for that dedicated and wonderful breed of men known as astronauts. Instead, today, I want to emphasize that every one of us, if we really want to, can be an explorer, a pioneer, a discoverer. As examples of what I mean, I want to tell you about the excitement of discovery experienced by several young men, young men who are earthbound, but who have unchanged, unchained Im imaginations, young men with whom I've had the pleasure of working in recent years. I guess the point I want to make to the young people here today and to those who are guiding them is that one way to find fun and excitement and hard work in between is by creatively learning new things about nature and creatively putting them to good use. Like the thrill Tom Grubb and Len Niedrack felt as they watched that little electric motor spin the tiny model airplane propeller, even though rubber bands would do it better. Like Dick Roberts and Bob Owens first starting that lawnmower engine, even though it looked exactly like millions of lawnmower engines in garages all over the country. Like Al Hay, seeing those surgical instruments being removed from a steaming autoclave. But I'm, I'm getting ahead of my story, of course, and you don't even know what I'm talking about yet. Let me tell you about it. They're separate stories, although the protagonists all have several things in common. They're all young. They all became interested in science at a very early age, and they all were fortunate to have teachers who nurtured their interests. And they all worked within a few hundred feet of each other on different things, but in a similar atmosphere of creative enthusiasm. My first example might be called a low pressure story since it deals with high vacuum. In recent years, scientists have learned how to achieve extremely high vacuum using very special laboratory equipment. Let me explain what I mean about high vacuum. This morning, the radio said the barometric pressure here in Oklahoma City was 29.91 inches, or about 760 millimeters of mercury. At this pressure, each teaspoonful of the Oklahoma air around us contains about a hundred quintillion atoms. Now, a quintillion takes 18 zeros after the one. Now, mm -hmm. 150 miles straight up from here, where astronaut Cernan was walking around just a month ago, there are comparatively fewer atoms per spoonful. The barometric pressure is quite low, less than one millionth of a millimeter of mercury instead of 760. And scientists can now achieve in the laboratory pressures as much as a million times lower than that, although hardly in anything large enough for walking around in. But even in a small vacuum chamber with practically nothing at all in it, a group of our research people found a way to get big results. These came about because they were also interested in surface chemistry, especially the study of metal surfaces. Now, if I were to use this key 
which Mayor Shirt kindly gave me, scratch the metal surface of this microphone, I would make, uh, well, I'd make an awful noise, that's what I'd make, but in addition to that, I'd make a fresh metal surface. But that scratch would be a fresh surface, absolutely clean, for only about one billionth of a second. In that fleeting instant, some of those quintillion atoms per spoonful in this room would bump up against the fresh scratch, stick there, and make a coating on it. Well, a billionth of a second is a pretty short time in which to study a fresh metal surface. So, it was decided <coughs> to use new, we're quick, you know, but not quite that quick. <laughs> so it was decided to use new high vacuum techniques to study fresh surfaces in slow motion. If astronaut Cernan, during his walk in the vacuum of space, by any chance, scratched the outside of Gemini 9, the new surface stayed fresh for several seconds. In the laboratory, new techniques have made it possible to take a really good look at new metal surfaces, created in high vacuum, of course, over a period of several hours or days. The long, hard job of using these new techniques to see what could be learned has now produced many useful results. Some of these came in a rather unex unexpected area of understanding friction. As you know, in every machine that has moving parts, there are problems of friction, lubrication, wear. Because fresh metal surfaces, fresh for only the tiniest fraction of a second, are fundamentally involved in these phenomena, scientists have never had a very full understanding of the hows and whys of friction. High vacuum gave a new way to look at this problem in slow motion. You can imagine that this idea stirred some real excitement. An obvious metal to look at first was aluminum, since aluminum is notoriously hard to lubricate. With even the best of ordinary lubricants, aluminum tends to seize and weld together when you try to slide two pieces against each other. Studies of fresh aluminum surfaces conducted under high vacuum then produced entirely new knowledge about what really happens chemically when aluminum moves against aluminum or some other metal, excitement. Then some entirely new lubricants were created. Using these lubricants, aluminum bearings were made with friction as low as those of traditional Babbitt bearings. More excitement. Soon a whole new family of aluminum lubricants was on the market. Design engineers were finding a myriad of unexpected ways to use them. Small electric motors made by the millions for home appliances were completely redesigned and improved with aluminum bearings. More excitement and satisfaction from seeing the idea pay off. And further, there was the excitement of realizing that aluminum lubricants were only a first step. One of these high vacuum experts is named Dick Roberts. He likes to say, by the way, that he's learning more and more about less and less. He was working side by side with Bob Owens, a, a young mechanical engineer, who got intrigued with finding problems that new lubricants could solve. Together, they took a vacuum look at some other hard to lubricate materials. Among these other materials are stainless steel and that highly touted space age metal, titanium. Some especially creative chemistry led to the discovery of lubricants that would work with both titanium and stainless steel. That the miracle additive in the lubricant, in this case, was based on ordinary iodine. And thus, as somebody said, uh, ordinary iodine moved out of the medicine cabinet and into the space age. Dick and Bob wanted to prove conclusively that their new iodine lubricants would work with materials that engineers had believed for years could not possibly be used where friction was involved. So they built a very common machine with moving parts, a gasoline engine for a lawnmower, out of a variety of materials. At one place or another in this engine, they had titanium sliding on titanium, titanium on stainless steel, stainless on stainless, and both on ordinary steel, and so forth. Our metallurgists, who seem to be a little skeptical of this exercise, said, uh, we don't want to be around when you try to start that thing. But Bob and Dick put their iodine lubricant in the crankcase and experienced the thrill of seeing that machine that shouldn't run at all run perfectly. Now, because titanium is important for the outer skin of spacecraft and supersonic aircraft, and because these parts must be shaped and formed, 
And because the new iodine lubricants are proving more and more useful for such applications every day, I think it's safe to say that Dick Roberts and Bob Owens have a lot more fun to look forward to. Now let's go to Al Hay. Al Hay had a different kind of exciting idea a few years ago. This story really started as a result of his work in organic chemistry when he was still way back in graduate school. And in Al Hay's case, it's not nearly as long ago as it is in mine. Back in graduate school, Al became interested in oxidation reactions. Well, of course, an oxidation reaction is a fancy phrase for what happens on a grand scale every time you light a match involving millions and millions of molecules. But Al was interested in using an oxidation reaction to perform a selective and carefully controlled operation on a specific part of a single molecule. In short, he had an idea for creating a new kind of plastic material by a process that might be called a, a slow burn. The idea was exciting enough that uh, Al was seen in his laboratory night and day, weekends and holidays, tracking down and trying the seemingly endless combinations of raw materials and chemical catalysts that might work best. He had plenty of disappointments and frustrations, but he also had the thrill of producing, within a few months, an entirely new polymer material called polyphenylene oxide, and we call it PPO for short. PPO was exciting from the beginning because it was a plastic material with unique properties such as excellent strength at high temperatures, excellent resistance to hot water and salt water and so forth. Before long, pilot plant quantities of PPO had been produced. One of the first experimental applications was to mold the plastic into the complicated shapes of surgical instruments. PPO proved to be the first moldable plastic material that could repeatedly withstand the temperature and steam of operating room autoclaves used for the sterilization of such instruments. Sure, Al Hay was pleased and excited because his idea provided an answer to lighter weight, easier to handle surgical instruments. But that was only the beginning because PPO proved to be the strong polymer material that people had been looking for, for hundreds of new and useful purpose, purposes. Within the past year and a half, a new company has been created in the Netherlands to make PPO for the European markets. Another new PPO company is being formed in Japan, and later this year, within a few miles of where Al did his first test tube work, a new multi-million dollar manufacturing plant will be completed and in the business of producing PPO by the carload. Al remains even more excited about the next generation of new polymer materials that's coming from his original discovery, a revolutionary basic chemical process called oxidative couplings. Finally, I want to tell you the story of Tom Grubb and Len Niedrak and the fuel cell. I must say, parenthetically here, that I didn't check with the astronaut guests to find out if the thing worked or not, but since I didn't read anything in the newspapers, I assumed it did. <coughs> fuel cells were, or the idea for fuel cells was invented in England way back in 1939. But last month, when astronaut Stafford and Cernan used a fuel cell to provide onboard electricity for the Gemini 9, it was only the fourth time in history that there had ever been a practical application for a fuel cell. The first three times were Gemini 5, Gemini 7, and Gemini 8. <clears throat> now by practical application, I mean that these were the only times in history when a fuel cell was ever used where it had to be used, when nothing else could have been done. No other device could have provided the Gemini spacecraft with as much power for such a long time without exceeding the weight limitations. And I'm sure our honored guests here would agree that it would have required a very long extension cord. <laughs> <laughs> without going into technical detail about fuel cells, just let me say that a fuel cell is a device that converts chemical energy in common fuels directly into electrical energy with no moving parts. You're all familiar with a process called electrolysis, you know, putting an electric current through water to separate it into hydrogen and oxygen. 
In the simplest form of the fuel cell, hydrogen and oxygen are put back together again to make water and generate electricity in the process. It's fundamentally an extremely efficient method of making electric power. Some 10 years ago, Tom Grubb got the exciting idea that ion exchange membranes might be used as electrolytes in a fuel cell. Ion exchange membranes were a relatively new kind of material, then being considered mostly as a means of removing salt from water. Tom's inspiration was followed by a typical collection of disappointments and troubles, but the advent of the space age in 1957 provided ample motivation to continue. The first Sputnik convinced Herman Leibovsky, who was Tom Grubb's boss, that fuel cells might be important in space. For such specialty applications, the ion exchange membrane cell appeared to be a very good bet. Tom built his first tiny fuel cell, which used pure hydrogen and oxygen to generate an electric current. This fundamental discovery, of course, benefited from improvements made by Len Niedrach, a colleague working in the same group, and help from a number of others, too. Soon, Tom and Len had a fuel cell hooked up to run a small motor and turn a very small propeller, about the size of those used in model airplanes. It wasn't very impressive until you realize how simple this generator was and the fact that it seemed to run almost forever on a very small amount of fuel. Well, there's not time today to relate the sequence of research and development events and the work of hundreds of scientists and engineers and the disheartening frustrations between these hard-won successes that took the early grub knee drag cell to the very sophisticated fuel cell units used in the Gemini program. Let's just say that when those first practical fuel cells did work successfully in Gemini 5 last August, there were two mighty proud and happy fellows named Grubb and Niedrak watching the news. And of course today, these two and their many associates in fuel cell research are more enthusiastic than ever about the future of fuel cells. Recently, they found ways to use common fuels, ordinary hydrocarbons, like come out of the wells out here such as natural gas and diesel oil and so on. Along with dozens of other dedicated scientists and engineers, they're trying to find ways to make fuel cells like that at a cost that will make them attractive for many applications much more commonplace than Gemini spacecraft. Well, these examples of earthbound adventure are only three from among countless stories that might be told about recent scientific achievements. They've been told merely to illustrate that the excitement of discovery can come to many people in many ways if they will seek it imaginatively and creatively. Today, we salute all pioneers of the frontiers of science. We salute the explorers of outer space, of whom there can be for now at least only a few. We salute the explorers of the inner secrets of nature, of whom there can be and must be thousands coming from the ranks of fine young people like those here today. We salute you all, wish you the fun, the hard work, the thrills, and the excitement of discovery. Mr. Young, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, I'd like to add uh, one thing to uh, what Dr. Bika said about the hospitality. I am from Texas. I can report we've lived uh, quite peaceably for several years between the two states. Uh, and I would like to uh, say uh, that I can sincerely return to Texas uh, when I get back there and say that I can report the friendly, the native friendly in, in Oklahoma City. Uh, the Frontiers of Science Foundation, you may not realize, <coughs> is becoming quite well known. <coughs> <coughs> I quit smoking, now I can't talk. <coughs> I was okay with two packs a day. As a matter of fact, for a young organization, I believe that it is has become very well known. I will point out, however, something that you might realize, most of you here, that you have a front man that most organizations don't have, namely James Webb, who uh, spreads the word far and wide and in Washington in particular, about the fine work and the aims and the progress that the, the uh, 
Frontiers of Science Foundation is making. He has passed his very special good wishes to you, and I won't apologize for his not being here. I'm sincerely glad he is not here, because if he were, I would not be, and I am very pleased to be here and be a part of this memorable occasion. Thank you. Thank you very much, General Jones. I once heard a scientist say that where there is an open mind, there will always be a frontier. The frontiers of science here in Oklahoma City are mighty glad to have Dr. Beaker and General Jones and the rest of you scientists here today. And now to present America's latest explorers of space. It is my pleasure to call on the Honorable Mike Monroney, senior United States Senator from Oklahoma. Senator Monroney worked with James Webb to make the appearance of Tom Stafford and Eugene Cernan possible. Senator Monroney. Thank you very much, Chairman Young, for the introduction, for the opportunity of being here. Governor Winters, Mayor Shirk, Chairman McGee, and distinguished officers and members of the Frontiers of Science, members of the Chamber of Commerce and our distinguished guests from Weatherford. I'm happy to be on a program today that Thank you very much, Chairman Young, for the introduction for the opportunity of being here. Governor Winters, Mayor Shirk, Chairman McGee, and distinguished officers and members of the Frontiers of Science, members of the Chamber of Commerce, and our distinguished guests from Weatherford, I'm happy to be on a program today that I think will be remembered through the years as being one of the outstanding scientific programs ever given in Oklahoma. We appreciate so much Dr. Beaker's marvelous address. We appreciate being honored here today by having the opportunity to be hosts to two of our most distinguished Americans. They're here today to allow us to express our appreciation to them in person. Yes, and to their wives who waited through that long three days for their great help in establishing American supremacy in outer space. We in Oklahoma are honored because these two men who have risked so much give the United States its preeminence are not only men of tremendous courage, skill, and technical ability, but have proven their great interest in the field of education and training in the aeronautical and astronautical sciences as well. We're proud indeed of both of them, especially proud of our own fellow Oklahoman, Colonel Stafford, who was born in Weatherford, Oklahoma on September 17, 1930, went through the Oklahoma public school systems and was chosen to represent the Western District of Oklahoma in the great U.S. Uh, Naval Academy uh, and uh, was commissioned on graduation, of all things, in the United States Air Force. And believe me, you have to be pretty darn good uh, to come out of the Naval Academy and get into the United States Air Force. <laughs> he was educated in the higher skills of fighter interceptor aircraft, and later in the United States Air Force Experimental Flight Test School at Edwards Air Force Base in California. He served as chief of the performance branch of the United States Air Force Aerospace Research Pilot School at Edwards. And here he's responsible for the supervision and administration of the flying curriculum for student test pilots. Not only mastered the science, but they say when they want to be real complimentary, he wrote the book all about it. And he is the Establishment, he established the textbooks and is co-author of the pilot's handbooks for performance flight testing and for aerodynamics handbook for performance flight testing. After 4,700 hours of flight time, 3,800 of these hours in jets, he was chosen by NASA to be one of the nine astronauts in September 1962. At that time, of all things, he was not a test pilot working at Edwards Air Force Base, but to show his versatility, he was attending as an honor student from the services of the Harvard Graduate School of Business Administration. <laughs> Colonel Stafford was 
pilot and the backup crew on the first manned Gemini flight. On December 15th and 16th in 1965, he was pilot of the history-making GT-6 flight, which established another first in space by performing the first rendezvous of two manned maneuverable spacecraft with the orbiting GT-7. With his distinguished pilot, who we are happy to have here today, Pilot Cernan, he was command pilot of the Gemini 9 and the most spectacular space exploits yet achieved, which began on June 3rd, 1966, and remained in orbit for approximately three days. This exhibition thrilled the entire world and particularly those in America who followed it throughout the entire period. The degree of excellence in education and educational pursuits followed Commander Cernan as it did Colonel Stafford. He took his Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Purdue University, and his Master of Science degree in Aeronautical Engineering from the United States Naval Postgraduate School. His educational attainments won him membership in Tau Beta Phi, National Engineering Society, and in Sigma Xi, the National Science Research Society. May I add that I'm glad to note he's also a member of Pi Gamma Delta Social Fraternity. He is one of the outstanding graduates uh, of our college reserve officer system, having received his commission through the Naval ROTC program at Purdue and entered flight training upon his graduation. Prior to attending the Navy postgraduate school, he was assigned to attack squadrons 126 and 113 at Miramar, California Naval Air Station, where he logged more than 1,800 hours of flying time and more than 1,600 of these were in jet aircraft. As a member of the third group of astronauts, he was selected by NASA in October 1963. He was part of the Gemini 9 mission, and it was during this spectacular flight that he spent a record time of two hours and ten minutes on a spacewalk, multiplying by more than ten to fifteen times the amount of time ever spent in outer space uh, uh, outside of the capsule in which he had been carried there but it certainly wasn't as simple as it sounds when you mentioned it today. This was an exploit that will be long remembered and developed so many, many important leads in our space navigation that I think he can claim to have established an outstanding record that will lead us forward to many, many breakthroughs. And so I am privileged indeed to present two men who have brought America to a preeminence in outer space by their courage and knowledge and by their reports on what they found, I'm happy to present Oklahoma's own Tom Stafford and his fellow astronaut, Gene Cernan. Thank you. Senator Monroney, Chairman Young, President McKee, distinguished guests, and many old friends from Weatherford and the people of Oklahoma. It is really great for Gene and myself and our families to be here as a guest of the Frontiers of Science in the Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce. One thing I think the mayor forgot to mentioned when he presented Gene with this key was the fact he has presented a key to the largest city in the United States. I was in Chicago, and that has quite a population, but uh, by and large, this is the largest city in the United States. It's undisputed. No, and again, saying uh, the, um, the reception that we've received here is very heartwarming. It is really tremendous to see all the people turn out, and believe me, it is always a great pleasure to return to my home state. And I am particularly pleased to have this opportunity to attend the annual meeting of the Frontiers of Science. As you know, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration has a very sincere interest in your organization here, from Administrator Webb on down. I am impressed with the foresight that your first president had when he helped establish this organization, and he continues to display now as our administrator. 
I know that he is well pleased with the continuing progress that you're making in promoting science education in the schools. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration ranks high on a list of organizations who have a constant need for more trained scientists and engineers. Yes, your organization and mine have one goal in common, that of stimulating interest in scientific knowledge. As Mr. Webb has stressed, the principal product of the Space Administration is knowledge. And believe me, knowledge is power. The ability to do more creative and useful things in space, as well as right here upon the Earth, as Dr. Biko so amply described earlier today. It is impossible to really place a price tag on the value of new scientific knowledge, know-how, and engineering through an advancement that we make through research and development. We do know that such documentation of this would stagger the imagination. When you and I pause to use our imaginations for this purpose, we realize we're now living in the most fantastic age in mankind. More history and more technical progress have happened in our lifetime than in a whole previous history of the world. A famous speaker on scientific progress stated that you can graph the first 50,000 years of man's technical history on a piece of graph paper approximately four inches high. But from 1945 until 1965, that graph paper would have to be equal to a building 13 stories high. Yet with this fantastic surge of knowledge, believe me, we have barely skirted the border of an ocean that reaches out into infinity. To you and the frontiers of science and the many other people who encourage our youth's interest in science, I'd like to mention a few items that our flights have contributed to space science and to the benefit of mankind. An example of this was the ability to rendezvous in orbit, which Wally and I did in Gemini 6, and which Gene and I also did three of in Gemini 9. This rendezvous is the beginning of transportation in space. No outer planetary man probe will go there until we do a rendezvous around the Earth. We do not have this power available to us. It means going somewhere. In Apollo, the size of the velocity vector changes that we can generate for the first time will permit man to leave his orbit around the Earth and strike out for the moon, which is the first stepping stone in our great solar system. Now, as the performance of each individual flight is assured, the objective to bring back meaningful information becomes more important. During the Gemini 9 flight, Gene and I learned many things that were necessary to discover prior to entering the final phases of the manned lunar landing program. Some of the things that seemed to go wrong during the flight really served as an indication to increase our knowledge along these lines. In addition to operating the scientific equipment, the crew members aboard the spacecraft were also able to make useful observations to select and interpret these observations and report them for the benefit of mankind. A good example of this was the fact that the country of Peru has spent 30 years making photo maps for geology surveys of their country. Due to the mountainous terrains of the Andes Mountains and the bad weather, after 30 years, at the cost of many people's lives, climbing mountains and also pilots' lives, they have been able to photo map 19% of that country. We were fortunate and had good weather. In three and a half minutes, Gene and I photo mapped 80% of the country of Peru. And this is, these, these geological maps are turned over to their country and they've been a great benefit to them. Also, we photo mapped approximately 70% of the whole Andes mountain chain. And this, this was rather longer. This took about six minutes. Another example is from the benefits of our flights. Uh, Gordo Cooper and Pete Conrad made a series of photos in the central Australian desert on Gemini 5. These photos showed some very interesting geological structure and now oil exploration is going on based on the photos that they made during Gemini 5. So you can see that the scientific and engineering aspects of space travel are unending challenges to ourselves and also to the youth of our country. As Dr. Robert Goddard, the father of American rockery, said, it is difficult to say what is impossible, for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. You who are encouraging our youth of today 
know that your dream of yesterday is certainly coming true. And as you assist our youth, who are the hope of today, you can certainly rest assured that your work will bear fruit in the realities of tomorrow. As representatives of the NASA astronaut team, we'd like to encourage you to continue your great dedicated efforts. And to the men of the frontiers of science, a sincere thanks from our entire group. Now, I'd like to have Gene come up here and say a few words. You know, he kept accusing me of being an Oklahoma politician and always talking on a flight, you know. <laughs> I told him I'm from the short grass country out in western Oklahoma, and we have produced a few politicians from out there, believe me, but uh, <laughs> my work is strictly scientific. I want no political office, believe me. So. <laughs> but I want to introduce Gene to you. I've had the great privilege of working with him for six months. In fact, uh, we flew together every place, and he just become like two brothers up there. And all through the three days of the flight, uh, we worked with a great teamwork, and uh, I know he wants to say a couple words to you. We have a movie uh, to follow very shortly, so I, I won't take up uh, very much of your time, time. but uh, I'd like to say to distinguished guest and Brother Monroney, fraternity brother, <laughs> you, you noticed that buildup, didn't you? <laughs> and certainly all of what I feel are my newfound friends in Oklahoma. I'd just like to say thank you for the invitation uh, you've extended uh, for myself. <coughs> and my wife to come here to Oklahoma City. Uh, you're welcome to repeat a word Tom used. Uh, it has been very heartwarming. Uh, we've been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, the day already is tremendous, uh, and we're looking for the events that are to follow. You people can be justly proud of the man you primarily came here to honor today, Tom Stafford. Uh, I've grown to know him uh, very well over the past few months. And I know he is also very proud of Oklahoma and certainly of the people that make up uh, the state of Oklahoma. He is, uh, he's sort of been your representative to me and to a lot of other people. And uh, through my associations and uh, through my knowing him and working with him so well and so long, I can see why he is so very proud of his heritage here in Oklahoma. What I'm really trying to say is uh, if I had an opportunity to choose someone to work with and fly with uh, who was as capable and intelligent and as dedicated as Tom Stafford, uh, then he would be my man, and you could certainly be proud of his representation of uh, you people here, not only in Weatherford and not only in Oklahoma City, not only in Oklahoma, but in our whole country. Uh, without... Uh, Without taking any more time, I'd like to introduce this film that we have. Uh, Tom and I had some great experiences on Gemini 9, but uh, Gemini 9 wasn't our flight alone any more than the entire space program belongs to solely to the astronauts. It belongs to a great many people like yourselves who support this program and who are honestly and sincerely as interested and dedicated towards this program as we are. So. To maybe take you on a 15, a short 12 to 15 minute flight with us, we have some excerpts. Uh, they're silent. Uh, they're sort of raw excerpts that we thought you might be interested in that we have pulled out of some of our flight film. Uh, we'd like to go ahead and, and show these to you now. Uh, they start with the liftoff of the Atlas booster, and Tom and I together uh, will narrate this film for you. I think that uh, there's some things that uh, we can explain better through the film and hope that uh, we can give you our three-day ride here in about 12 minutes. We can go ahead as soon as the lights go down and uh, start the film off. To start with, this is the gantry over on pad 14. This is the same pad that launched all the Mercury astronauts is being rolled back for our Atlas and ATDA, which later became our Angry Alligator. Here we see the 
verniers and the small engine ignition followed by the large engines, and away we go. With 330,000 pounds of thrust on the th three engines of the Atlas. At this time, Tom and I were still sitting uh, in our Gemini spacecraft atop our own Titan booster uh, on our second try. This was on the 1st of June, I believe. Uh, we didn't go this time, but two days later, uh, we'll show you here in a minute, we did. The Atlas booster, as you know, has three engines, and as it approaches staging, two of them shut down, and a single one propels it into orbit. Here we'll see a staging sequence that occurs about 40 miles downrange and nearly 50 miles in altitude. There it goes. The two engines are dropping off, slowly tumbling back towards Earth, while the third engine propels the target vehicle into a 185 statute mile circular orbit. That fireball you saw there was similar to the fireball that we have on the Titan booster that you may have heard that we flow fly through at staging. It's a big red and orange fireball, but it happens in a microsecond, and uh, it's very beautiful but very quick and, op and does no damage at all. This was Tom's sixth trip up the pad for his second flight. That, that's a record uh, that's going to stand for a long time, believe me. Well, th well, this time I thought I owned a part of this east elevator on pad 19, believe me. He may not be a politician, but he's chairman of the board of uh, a group of which Wally Shira has gone up three times, I've gone up three times, and Tom has gone up six times. That showed a view of the Titan booster with the Jiminy spacecraft. It's over 120 feet tall, 10 feet in diameter. And here are the technicians putting us in the Gemini 9 spacecraft for the final try where we made it. I'm on the left, Gene is on the right. And this process was taking place while they, they launched the ATDA on the, the second try. This time they're starting to close the hatches. Uh, also, when you hear those dogs slam shut, you know it's too late to check it out. You're kind of locked in there. <laughs> There we go. This is a bright orange smoke. Uh, we can feel the rumble, and there go the bolts, and uh, there's no doubt you're on your way at that point. Talk about not checking it out. This is where you can, really can. The liftoff well, was very smooth, and the roar died down until we hit supersonic uh, in the transonic range, and it smoothed down again. But the old Titan really gave us a beautiful ride uh, right down the range. And uh, people ask, what is the most thrilling part of space flight? Well, there's about two or three major parts. And I think the end of it uh, is, is the end of boosted phase when that second stage burns out and you pick up 2,000 miles in the last 10 seconds. It really slams you out there and then bang, you're home. So that's quite a sensation. We're probably going through about five or 6,000 miles an hour right now and at staging it's about 7,000 and then we pick up to s over seven, oh, close to 18,000 miles an hour when we actually get into orbit. We're doing a great many things here besides just riding along. We're monitoring systems and uh, doing a number of functions. Uh, I'd sort of like to just go along for the ride one time. It sure was nice, but uh, you're quite busy. Believe me, it's the only way to fly. <laughs> this next sequence we'll have to catch in a hurry. It's the first rendezvous we did at midnight. This is also the first rendezvous that was ever done in complete darkness. At where you, and you see some flashing lights like a Christmas tree. This was the our Angley alligator at a little past midnight uh, off the coast of Australia. It was tumbling in over end, and Gene and I joined up and held position within about 20 feet of it. And all we had was those red lights. And now we see it in the daytime as we approach Hawaii over the Pacific Ocean. And we can see the strap that's there that's holding on and caused the malfunction there on the nose cone. Uh, one, go ahead. Well, this is, this is slightly out of sequence. This is the rendezvous from above. This was our third rendezvous coming down. We completed over the Indian Ocean. As you look down there, you can tell that you're really moving out at 18,000 miles an hour. It's a pretty tricky job coming down from above, looking down at the ground with all those relative motion vectors there to try to make that rendezvous. At this point, it almost feels like you're uh, nose diving right back on into the atmosphere, but of course you're, you're not at all. But the target was very difficult to see across different terrain features, the ocean, the clouds, the desert. Uh, this is why we wanted to investigate this particular type of rendezvous, and from it we certainly uh, learned a great deal. One thing that, that impressed me, it still does, is the fact that uh, three and a half hours earlier, we were sitting on a pad at Cape Kennedy, and uh, at this point, we're 185 miles above the surface of the Earth, moving at 18,000 miles an hour, next to a vehicle which was launched over two days earlier. Uh, I don't know, that sort of impressed me uh, to a point where I'd like to do it again. <laughs> Before we left the angry alligator, Gene and I flew close formation. Here you'll see the jaws of it just about six inches away. And we flew formation on it to get a series of data to 
to bring back for the ground-based people uh, so we could see what failed with it. And actually, we turned the Gemini spacecraft upside down out near the, the jaws of the alligator, put the uh, windshield of the Gemini within three inches of it, and then flew formation with it. Here we're moving down within one foot of the Gemini, of the uh, angry alligator. You can see the strap, and if you look close, you can see those four wires that were holding the strap on, but we determined later there's also two more huge electrical bundles down on the inside that had to be pulled. So uh, from all <coughs> aspects, it was probably the best thing we left it alone. To give you an idea of where we were going to dock, uh, if, if the jaws were removed, uh, were they open, we would have docked right in that end, that particular end of the uh, uh, target docking adapter. Uh, the fact that we didn't dock, certainly uh, this was one of our goals on a flight, uh, uh, was somewhat overshadowed from the fact that we were required to, as, as you see what Tom was doing here, fly formation on a drifting vehicle and almost nullify our relative race with respect to it. So he proved to me, certainly, and then uh, we, we switched off on a flying, that, that we could actually fly almost to any spot uh, with, any, with a reasonable angular rotation that we have here. and. Uh, almost write our names in the, in the uh, angry alligator if we so desired. Uh, another interesting fact about the shroud actually being on is that it was painted white. The rest of the vehicle was painted silver. There's a great contrast uh, between the white and the silver, uh, as you can see in, in different spots and under different lighting conditions. This also gave us an opportunity to evaluate how we should paint a vehicle, what colors we might want to paint it uh, for rendezvous where we do not necessarily have radar, do not necessarily have a computer. We actually, we conducted one of these rendezvous on our second, uh, our second rendezvous where we had to maintain visual acquisition or visual sight and the fact that the shroud was there proved to us that uh, we needed a big white background to rendezvous on. If you notice just about a minute ago you saw the, uh, the electric, the strap around the shroud and also the wires. That and he, oh, this is an interesting point. Down below, you see that's blue. That is earth shine below and sunshine above. So you can see the contrast of light that is reflected off of the earth up on the vehicle. And see the difference between sunshine above and earth shine down below. And right there, you see all the black? That's the way the sky looks in the daytime in space. It is absolutely black. Again, uh, we come down, now right here, we're moving into within about three or four inches. You see we're stabilized there, three or four inches upside down, rolling with it to take pictures of those wires so we could bring back data. I think you'll all agree now that you see, you've seen some pictures, I know, but when you see this thing in motion actually rotating up there, you, Tom very aptly named it the angry alligator because it almost looked like it wanted to snap back at us at times. Again, we're continuing this close investigation, and right there you can see those two square boxes and the little lines that lead out from them. This is what was holding it on. Again, we move in within two to three inches of the plane of the shroud and slowly move up to it to take those pictures. There you see the wires and the whole malfunction. Something else that was very interesting. Well, see that? You probably all saw that uh, little rope or line, which is part of where the angry alligator separates from the Atlas booster. When it moves, there's no air up there, basically no air, very few molecules uh, of anything. Uh, but what you see is, t is the thrusters from our spacecraft, as we fired them, impinging on the, on the angry alligator and thus waving anything that was free to move or free to wave. Something else that was very interesting is the fact that uh, the moon was almost full when we were out there, and we were able to see at night uh, reflection from the moon on the angry alligator, which uh, we had not really expected. Tom can probably explain a little bit about this particular lighting because I must admit I had my head in the cockpit at uh, that time doing a little paperwork. Here is an interesting example. You see the black sky, the blue Pacific Ocean, also a brilliant blue band. That is the Earth's atmosphere as you look at it sideways. But you see how black the sky is up above, how brilliant the clouds are below, but that thin, beautiful blue band, which is the Earth's atmosphere as you look into it sideways. The nose of the alligator is just going through the blue band that represents our Earth's atmosphere. You can tell that there's a great many clouds uh, around a great part of the world, a uh, great many more than we expected. Tom said on Gemini 6 uh, he didn't remember seeing anything but Cape Kennedy and the ocean. Uh, and there were a great many cr uh, clouds during the month of December, but even during our, our flight in June, there were many, many clouds around. Here's the only film we got of Gene's uh, walk outside. 
Here Gene is around on the nose with the umbilical, and he's investigating stabilizing himself and handholds and, and how should he design future spacecraft by these handholds. It was only a short film, and uh, so we're real sorry we didn't get any more film. Is, is there any question now of why we are incorporating ballet lessons into our training? <laughs> This picture now has started the re-entry. It's the first one that's ever been recorded. And we're starting to f hit the Earth's atmosphere. This is over the Louisiana coast, and everything's starting to turn a bright red as our spacecraft heat shield burns up on us. And the whole spacecraft nose section will start to turn red. If you look down in the lower corner, you see a red dot down there. That is our retro adapter section burning up as it comes in. And uh, then, we, then we start to form these brilliant shock waves. You notice how the nose is starting on the left there is starting to turn a cherry red. And it really gets hot out there. Gene uh, made these pictures while I was flying it, and he was interrogating the computer and uh, telling it the directions to go. And it, it's, it's quite a scene. In fact, Gene was saying, gee, Tom, look out there. And I said, uh-uh, I'm scared. <laughs> really, these, these colors here are, are even somewhat subdued from what we've actually seen. And, and all I can recommend uh, for all of you to really appreciate the beauty of something such as a reentry is to uh, do it yourself. <laughs> At this time, we were starting to pull nearly six Gs coming in, and there's no doubt about it when you're coming in and the big, the big fireball all around you, you see the hypersonic shock waves out there, and also the way that they dance back and forth, you see the thrusters fire. Now, at this time, we are rolled heads. We're upside down and going backwards. And I've got a full lift vector since the vector is through my feet. And we're flying the needles, and at the end of the needles, we know is going to be the carrier wasp. Now, pretty soon, I'll reach a zero lift point, and we'll start to roll the spacecraft through a series of rolls. And this is just when the film runs out. But again, we're still upside down. We're now probably over uh, Georgia and, and crossing in the panhandle of Florida. Now we're starting to roll. You see the roll there? We know from now on all we need is zero lift, and ballistic. we've already lifted the major arrows out. And if you see the shocks, how it burned on the nose there, made the hot spots. And again, we're starting to roll, and we continue to roll for there. You see the sparks there on the nose section. And here's our target. In case you wondered, that was actually uh, pieces of our spacecraft, our heat shield, burning off. This is a what, what it's supposed to do, and it's burning. About this time, that poor little country boy from western Oklahoma, who's not going to be a politician, was saying, are we on television? Are we on television? <laughs> Well, here you're going to see the splashdown, and we sent up a column of water nearly 30 feet in the air. It was the hardest landing we've ever had in Gemini. And we went about six feet under the water and cracked your teeth, needless to say. And, uh, but it was real happy. There was no doubt when we returned to the Earth, there was one heck of a bang down there. Also, when, as soon as we went to a two-point attitude, I looked out the windshield, and there was a, a helicopter nose-to-nose -nose with me at about 2,000 feet. And as soon as Gene and I splashed down and popped up within 10 seconds, two frogmen jumped in the water right in front of us. Now, these boys did a tremendous job. Tom may be in the Air Force, but this is where his Navy training paid off. And he's always hungry for a carrier landing, you know. So we didn't come in on a helicopter. He said, I'm going to get a carrier landing, number two. Now, one thing, I did give my congratulations to Captain Hartley.